Welcome to another episode of the Looking After Nature podcast, where we hope to bring you close to the nature and wildlife in Hampshire. My name is Andy Davidson. I'm here once again with my co-host, Carly Harrod. Hi, Carly. Hi, Andy. Lovely to see you today. How are you? Doing fine. It's a, quite a lovely day. It was a bit foggy earlier, but I mean, it's very mild, isn't it? It is, but it's very foggy down in Southampton this morning. I had to have my lights on on my car. <laughs> But, I mean, hopefully people can hear, we've, we've got running water near us, we've got loads of birdsong. We have. Where are we today? We're up at Whitchurch, up in the north of the county. It's beautiful today, we're down by the River Test, and we're here today to talk with Jonathan Woods, who is our, one of our strategic managers for health and wellbeing. Yes, and hopefully we'll get a lovely walk today, I think we will, it's, it is lovely here. Yeah, and let's see how many nice flowers and nice pollinators we see on our way. Hi, morning, Jonathan. How are you doing? It's good to meet you. Hi, Andy. It's been a while since I've seen you and Carly. It's good to have an opportunity to have a walk with you. Absolutely. It's good to be in the flesh again, as, as yeah, it were. Indeed. Yeah, indeed. And we're at a li- really lovely place here, aren't we? I think we're quite fortunate to be and have such lovely rivers here in, um, in Hampshire. This is the test. Um, so what we're planning on doing today is having a walk around um, part of um, the Mill Trail in Whitchurch. Yeah. So we're heading out east. We're not starting from the railway station or we're not starting from the town centre. We're just starting on the east of Hampshire and on the, on the east of Whitchurch and walking out from there. Because um, what's your role in Hampshire? Because you work for the countryside service, don't you? So yeah, what's your I, actual yeah, role? Yeah, I do. Um, it's changed over the years. The primary part of it is looking after the rights of way network. So we've got nearly 3,000 miles of rights of way network across mm. the county. Um, almost every kilometre of the county has a good mile, a good length of distance in it. So I manage the three teams which maintain those routes, um, and I also manage the legal team who essentially do all the legal stuff around rights of way. Yeah. In addition to that, I've got planning teams. So anything that affects rights of way or our countryside sites or parks, I manage that team. And then I've got this overarching view on health and well-being. So um, over the the, um, last few years, we've been doing loads of work on on, uh, mapping out how important nature is for people and how we can get people out and about into the natural environment and get those sort of benefits, not just of exercise, but by understanding nature, they get that multiple benefit of being able to explore and discover. Yeah, yeah. Because there's definitely health and wellbeing benefits, as we keep talking about this in our podcast series, I think. Um, and even if you don't know what's here, you can still enjoy, because I can see uh, loads of biodiversity around us. There's celandines again, loads out today. Um, we can hear the noise of the river. Um, and there's loads of bird song. Mm. I mean, that really loud one uh, was a thing called a chetty's warbler. And it seems it's very skulking. You don't see it very often. It stays down in the bottom of the vegetation, but it shouts really loud. Yeah. You know, so now there's a lot to see here and hopefully we'll see quite a bit as we wander around. Looking forward to it. So we're on, looks like the main, it's very straight here, which is quite unnatural, isn't it? You don't normally get straight rivers in nature. Well, I think a lot of the test is very straight, but I think that might all be because of the um, mills. Certainly in this area, but it's a very managed watercourse. Um, yeah. You'll see here that you've got um, you've got the the side of the bank is all mown um, along the river here. It's private. Yeah. So um, and that's managed by the river keeper. Yeah. That we've got who lives about 200 yards down the river here, mm. um, and he manages the river. He does the reed cutting, um, and he manages the banks for fishing. Um, it's one of the things I've found extraordinary really about fishing on the test is it's so expensive oh, you know yeah. it's um, yeah. people pay a lot of money to come fishing on the test and you know we're just stood here on the bridge and you know you see the quality of the fish just swimming be- below us here yeah i can see just below us there's a shoal of about five, at least five or six maybe up to a dozen trout very large trout um and now there's a native brown trout um, and there's the introduced rainbow trout. Okay. Now these, you can actually see on the side of the biggest ones, it's got like a, almost a bar of colour down the side, some of them on some angles. Yeah. 
and they've got spots on the fins, okay. some of them. So what does that make them? That makes them rainbow trout. Oh, fantastic. Um, now, the rainbow trout come from America. They're brought over as, a, you know, to fish for. Um, but there's the, the native brown trout. I think there might be one or two brown trout here. There's a couple of smaller ones without the dots on the back fin. Um, and clearly, I mean, these are a couple of pound a piece, some of these, aren't they? Yeah, they're they? big fish, um, which I find amazing because this is this bridge that we're stood on at the moment is a route to school. Literally ten, uh, 40 yards that way is the local school. Yeah. People cross this bridge every morning and actually when the gates are shut, they queue across this bridge. <laughs> and I don't think, there's nothing better than the children looking out uh, at these fish. Absolutely, and this is it. It's taking that time to, um, to as you say, just look around you, listen to things, see things. I mean, we were talking about looking down on these fish and one thing to notice is the fact you can see them because the water's gin clear, isn't it? Yeah, and that, you know, gin clear is an interesting expression. Yeah. Um, but at the top of the river here is the Bombay Sapphire Distillery. Yeah. Um, which has famously used the water mm. from this river to produce its gin. And that's the thing, it's, it's got so many uses because, I mean, I was talking before about this being so straight and it is quite heavily managed, but that's partly because of the building behind us. Um, so we've got this building that sits over there's two ch three channels four channels actually get yeah. so three on that side one on this yeah, and we can hear two wheels i think there's a yeah. wheel on that side and a wheel underneath here and we can see there's out the front here there's all sorts of gears and there's a big flat stone there yeah and this is one of the mills on here isn't it yeah yeah so sort of going uh, west to east you've got the fulling mill out um, to the west you've got the silk mill yeah in the centre of Whitchurch, which is open to the public, and you know it's one of, it's one of these just sort of amazing working mill experiences. Mm. Um, and then you've got this one, which is Town Mill, and you've got Beer Mill to the east. Yeah, because um, the mills effectively are here for the power of the water. Yeah, indeed. And a lot of these channels at the moment, because they need a consistent power level. Um, if it gets too high, it can flood them and destroy the wheel. If it gets too low, they won't have the power to do what they need to do. Because these were, you know, before the age of steam, this is how you did everything, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. How you ground flour. But there was, you say there was a silk mill here? Yeah, there's a silk mill. Uh, there was one point, they used to make some, uh, there was a paper mill, wasn't there? That's further up. That's, That's a mill. I'll talk to you about that later yeah, on. Yeah, because they um... used to make the paper. I don't know if they still do for the Bank of England banknotes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was a power source to drive the wheels and drive the machinery to do whatever you needed it to do. And traditionally that would have been grinding corn and things like that. But a lot of this control around here is so that you get a consistent level of power. Yeah. And I'll tell you, you know, no matter how much it rains yeah. or how dry it is, yeah. I've not seen this river flood and I've spoken to people who have lived around here a long, long time. Yeah. And I think they've, you know, over the last 50 years, only seen it lift its water above a level that, that, that you see now, yeah. maybe once or twice. And it's all because of the water management levels. Um, the only time it does tend to lift is just before they cut the reeds. Yeah. Because the reeds grow um, in, the, in the river base, and that sort of puts a little bit more pressure on the water. Yeah. It lifts, but it, that's the exact time when all the, all the, um, the reeds are cut. Yeah, it's um, all this weed on the bottom, isn't it, we're talking about? Yes. Yeah. So all the river keepers will tend to do that in one day, or try and do it at the same yeah, period. They, yeah. Because they go along with their sides and they yeah. cut the weed away, and all the weed floats down, and, you know, mm. so they're not choking each other up at this, you know. Yeah. It's really interesting. You'll see it better up at Beer Mill, but what they do is they literally cut a, a, a width across, Yeah. take about four strides forward, takes another width. Yeah. So it allows the reeds to flow with the water, drop lower, but also provides the shelter for the fish. Mm, yeah. And we were talking about the fishing here because, you know, we've got all these lovely big trout down here and there are some really very big trout down there, aren't there? <laughs> yeah, there is. Because um, the chalk streams, and this is what this is, this is chalk stream water, and they're called chalk streams because all this water tends to come out of the chalk. Chalk's very porous, so it falls on the downs above and then eventually reaches the groundwater level and comes out the various springs. And this is mainly chalk fed, which is why it's so clear. And it's also why it doesn't flood quite so often, because most of the water isn't coming from rainfall hitting the land and flooding in. 
Um, so you might get a bit of colour now and then, but mm. it's this clear because it is has been filtered through. Sometimes we're up to 60 years, all that chalk. Um, and the chalk streams in Hampshire are world famous, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got the Test is one of the most famous rivers in the world. Um, and people do come far and wide to fish on it. Yeah. But I think it's also one of those places where, you know, Han Hampshire does draw visitors yeah. from, from the wider country and, and wider area. And one of the key drives, you know, there is a lot of drives. You've got New Forest, the, the South Downs, but the rivers are one of those unique features yeah. in Hampshire. And uh, there is an abundance of, 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 of them. I suppose one of the things that I saw really blatantly a few weeks ago was when we had Storm Eunice come, come, come across and we lost some trees. Yeah. Um, and there was a tree up in um, a little community called Free Folk, literally came up from the riverbank. Yeah. And um, the depth of the roots was probably only a foot. Yeah. And when it came up, you could see how how high the chalk was. Yeah. It was, um, you know, it, it, the whole tree was on its side, the root ball was on its side, and within a foot you had chalk. Um, mm. And I think that's one of the things, you've got, it's not muddy, it's not sedimenty, yeah. um, the, 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 the river. Even when it's, you know, had, had, a, had a lot of rain, mm. you don't really see sediment in the river. Yeah. So, I mean, we basically come from where you live. You just live across the little bridge there and you, you do walk this very often. I, I walk and run around here very regularly. Mm. Um, but now I'm out here with the dog um, daily. It's a, it's a lovely place to be, actually. And this is, I think people are discovering the value of their local rights of way and getting out and exercising. I don't run very often, I have to say, but, you know, <laughs> but actually getting out in a natural environment is very important, I think. Yeah, and you know, I think, you know, I'm very fortunate to live here, um, so close to the, this path and, the, and these areas, but there's nature close to everybody. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's a matter of f finding your nearest park yeah. or green or wild area, but they are riddled throughout communities mm. um, and on the outskirts of villages quite often. Using the rights of way network, you mm. can find loads of countryside. So we come up, there's a little green area here, it's a little field, there's a lovely set of bushes down the side here with these sort of frothy white flowers on. You know this one, do you? Well, I think that's, I suspect that's a cherry, but um, yes. yeah, we've just been learning about that, <laughs> but because um, it's not got the thorns on it, but it's alongside a load of blackthorn. I yeah, it's, it's interesting, people, what you get in terms of um, when the things start flowering in the spring, one of the first things that start flowering is the willow. Mm. And this is all very important for the early spring pollinators, you know, I and mean, we've just seen a bumblebee. Hopefully we'll see some more. That'll be a queen bumblebee. And they come out of hibernation and they need pollinators, uh, pollinating plants to start their nests up with. You know, they'll start gathering pollen and nectar and start building their mm. nest. So you get the willow out first um, hopefully we'll see some of that, which is really good for loads of pollinators. And then you get the white flowers of the blackthorn start coming out. A week or so before the blackthorn comes out, you see quite a lot of this white flowers, particularly on the edges of amenity areas, on, on uh, roads and stuff like that. And it's not actually the native blackthorn, it's uh, one of the cherries. It looks really similar. It does, flower. doesn't it? But when you look at it, there's no thorns on that at all, is there? No. But it's still a no, good pollinating isn't. plant, but there's more insects that live on blackthorn particularly the leaves later in the year. Here we go, we've got a lovely bumblebee thrumming round. It's just flown off. Big fat thing, wasn't it? Yeah. So like the end of your thumb with a white tail and that's the white tailed bumblebee. I was going to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they have some of the biggest nests. What they do is they'll, that queen will get, she was um, fertilized last year by a male and all the workers and other bumblebees have died now and it's only young queens that have survived over the winter. Okay. So she'll spend the winter in hibernation. As it warms up in the spring, she can then come out. They can take it quite cold actually. Bumblebees can raise their own body temperature by 10 degrees by vibrating their wing muscles. Wow. You know, you think they're cold blooded, but they're capable of raising the temperature. Mm. Andy, so one of the things always interests me is black 
buckthorn and hawthorn. Yeah. And the fact that some leaf first, some flower first. Yeah. You know, so hawthorn, we've just talked about the blackthorn. Yeah. When did the hawthorn sort of start flowering? In about May. So okay. we're in April now. Um, the blackthorn, the flowers come out before the leaves. In hawthorn, it's the other way around. The tips of leaves will come out before the, the flowers. Okay. Um, and it's good because it means there's a succession of different pollinating plants, which include the bushes, um, that come out and it meets the needs of all the bees and everything else. Um, you see, this is an absolute mound of white, this one, and that's got really inch long thorns on it. Yeah, that's your black thorn. Um, and that's your black thorn. And actually, the flowers are denser, aren't they? Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I'm going to keep an eye out for the cherry and black thorn because yeah. it's not something. I've ever really noticed, except when we were looking at that, there was just no thorns on. Exactly the same flowers, yeah. perhaps less dense, but no thorns. But you can actually see there's a few, is that the same plant? Or is that another plant growing through it? They were, the leaves should be coming out not long afterwards. Yeah, there's, you can see some little tiny pints of leaf coming out here. Okay. Um, now there's a quite a lot of butterflies and moths feed on the leaves. Yeah. Some of the hair streaks, which are quite a nice little group of butterflies, feed on blackthorn. Um, and it's a great plant all round. You notice it most when it's in flower, and then the leaves come out and things feed on the leaves. And then of course the lovely sloes come out, because that's the fruit yes. of the blackthorn is the slow. Okay. We all know the best use for slows, don't we? Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, and actually what you see is people coming down here and, and foraging Yeah. Um, for those slows at the right time of year. So we've got here, this is a willow, and this is a great pollinating plant. And it's, people think about pussy willow catkins. Mm. I know some people cut it and stick it in, you know, in their house because it's one of the first flowers. Mm. And it, actually there's nothing wrong with, you know, with people taking a few bits and bobs. Mm. You know, there's a common law right to, um, to they call it the four Fs, uh, and to forage them. So it's flowers, fruit, fungi, and foliage. Okay. And if you've got a right to access somewhere, then um, unless there's any bylaws that restrict it, of course, um, you've got the right to take a certain amount of that for your personal use. Mm. So you're talking about the slows here. You know, I feel perfectly happy taking slows from here, mm. but it can't be if I'm selling it. Yeah, okay. So if my own personal, and clearly all the slow I produce is for my own personal use. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the willow here, I was saying, you can see there's a bit more yellow on those. It's still the pollen on them. Yeah, okay. And you can see there's loads of bumblebees still kicking around up there. You can see them flying around. Okay, so they're just taking that early pollen. Early pollen and nectar. Okay. And these ones, where they've gone a bit greener, they're still going to be producing po uh, nectar. Okay. So all the pollen's gone, but there's still nectar being produced over these. And if it was a little bit warmer, this would be buzzing with hoverflies and um, mm. and other bees. Well, hopefully in a day or two, we'll get yeah. a bit more warmth again. Right, so here we've got a hawthorn and these classic sort of, they're not round leaves, are they? They've got little lobes to them and they're all indented. And there's leaves out, these yeah. really fresh, fresh young leaves, but no flowers yet. And you've just been given some to eat, haven't you? Yeah, Carly's just passed me one. <laughs> what does it taste like? Um, I said salad. <laughs> it's um, it's green leaf, but yeah. um, it's not it's it's not ob you know objectionable. <laughs> I think the thing is, I mean, Carly was talking earlier about uh, it being called bread and cheese, mm. and I think it's not because it tastes of bread and cheese. If you've got your sandwich out in the field, a bit of bread and cheese, a bit of green in there, oh, you know, okay. it's a little salad leaf, as you say. So take a bit of that in there. Um, you know, as they're young and fresh, I think they get a bit tougher and a bit more bitter as they get older. Mm. Um, so clearly people used to put their in cheese sandwiches. And there are a lot of these different um, leaves you can eat. I mean, in some countries still, like Greece, there's a big tradition for eating what we might think of weeds. Okay. And they're very readily available salad leaves, basically, and they can do all sorts of cooking with it. I mean, clearly, you know, I think for the stuff on the ground, um, you might think twice because of the number of dogs here. Mm. Um, but if you, if you get out the dog wee zone, <laughs> yeah. well, then there's some really mistake. quite... There are some poisonous ones here as well you have to be careful of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, so um, it's like hogweed, that one there. Um, 
that's a bit, if you get the sap on you, it's a bit what they call photosensitive, so it makes you blister if you get in the sun. Okay. Um, but, you know, there'll be dandelions and salabonet. Salabonet is called salabonet because you can stick it in salads, you know. <laughs> um, and other birds like sheep sorrel. Um, so there's loads of stuff like that you can actually pick and eat. Okay. And also there's other uses for some of these things. Um, there's a plantain here, and I think the Latin name is Plantago medicago. Okay. Which clearly probably indicates some sort of me medicinal use. Medicinal yeah. use, <laughs> yes. And there's this really fine stuff is yarrow. Okay. And these in the summer, they'll get um, white flowers coming up with flat, flat. Well, they're, they're sort of multiple flowers in a flat head. Um, and yarrow, I think there's an old tradition of fairies and witches riding on yarrow stalks. Okay. You know, so pick a yarrow stalk and you offer you can fly like a broomstick. I've never tried it. But don't eat it, <laughs> <laughs> is what you're saying. I'd check before. <laughs> um, but again, that association sometimes with witches, quite often, is because it's got some medicinal use. Okay. Now you can see this, this willow here, it's like a brush of pollen. Look at that. Oh gosh, yes. And it just comes yeah. off on your finger. And I've actually seen some birds, you know, when I've been working, ringing birds, where they've got, there's a monk jack deer in the woods. And considering a group of people have just walked past that. Yeah. You know, and we're on the other side of it. It's a monk jack deer, about the size of a terrier, maybe a small Labrador. It's not a native species. No. I think the story is, um, if I remember rightly from where I used to work, um, that's one of um, the um, escapees from, is it Woburn? Woburn Park, I think. Wo yeah. Woburn Park, yeah. which um, not recently, but um, a long time ago, that and a couple of other deer types, yeah. they were collecting on the parkland, so yeah. escaped and yeah. spread across the country. So we've got a big patch of nettles here in front of us, which is quite often a sign of enrichment. So there's a lot of nutrients in the ground, you know. So, yeah. and they can be a bit of a pest, you know, if it takes over um, and it will smother out a lot of the plants, you know, like these wildflowers we're looking at behind us here. Um, but it's a good place for them. They are a decent native plant. Um, there's a lot of uses for them. I've never made it myself, nettle soup, yeah, I've had nettle tea as well. Nettle tea, have you? Right. I always wonder if you should call it tea if it's not actual tea leaves. You know, yeah. all these herbal teas. I don't think you should call them teas. Yeah, they're called infusions. Infusions, I think. that's it. So it's probably, teas. Yeah, it's probably so an infusion, infusion, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but you can eat the tops if you want to pick them. Um, maybe, I think you need to cook them to get rid of the sting mm. part. Yes. So they're a good food plant for a lot of butterflies. Okay. So uh, peacocks, red admirals, comma butterflies, you know, the, you'll, you'll see the little black larvae chewing their way through these leaves, as long as they're not sprayed or cut too often. Um, so they're a good plant, and there's quite a few uh, moths as well. The magpie moth mm. uh, feeds on nettle. Um, so if you've got a place somewhere you can leave a bit of nettle, it's good. But I know mm. I, I'll, you know, it can, can take over sometimes. So we come to a slightly different field here again, and it's a little bit different, isn't it? It's clearly managed slightly differently. Yeah, I think this one's insecticide. So it's not been disturbed for quite a while. So set aside is a, I don't actually use the phrase anymore because it was part of um, the agricultural policy. Yes, it was. Where to take, mainly it, it was actually trying to reduce the output of corn and stuff like that and so because it was like corn mountains and stuff like that because it was just overproduction so a farmer would take a field out of use and not crop it or do anything much okay. with it i mean this looks like what you might do with the rewilding is just let it go yeah um so it's a lot longer grass i've got some grass and i don't want any personal comments carly here i've got some grass taller than i am um and there's bramble bushes here, loads of tussocks of grass. That's a, that's a buddleia there. Yeah. Which is a, some we call it the butterfly bush. But again, it's a non-native. Okay. And it can take over if you let it. 
Um, and although it's a good pollen and nectar source, I and mean, if you've got a buddleia in your garden, mm. I get uh, hummingbird, hawk moths, and loads of different butterflies on that. Fantastic. But there's nothing that feeds on the leaves. Okay, it's just the flowers? Yeah. Um, but say you come through it quite a bit and you see, what do you see here? Oh, well, it, I think one of the things that's just quite nice is that this, we've just seen a mudjack a little bit further back there, and quite often you'll see the mudjack in here. Um, just above the grass height, yeah, you know, um, but they'll, you know, they disappear in the long grass. So I think they feel quite safe. Yeah. But uh, you know, if you're walking around here at dusk, what you'll quite often see is you'll be watching a deer, and then all of a sudden you'll see an owl skim across the surface. Yeah. And then disappear, dive down and disappear, and then reappear again, um, and again skim across the surface. Mm. Um, this is barn owls, is it? Yeah. 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 It's something to watch. Yeah, so I mean, clearly it's gone a certain way. I mean, I think it probably needs a bit of work. I mean, because if you just let it go, it will turn to scrub. But that mm. can be good. It's what, you know, that's part of what some people think of as rewilding, is let things go a bit more to scrub. You get loads of birds nesting in there, like these bramble bushes. You know, I can imagine there's going to be white throats and linnets feet uh, nesting in there over time. But you don't want it dominated by buddleia. Yeah. I'm talking to you like you're in control of the management, aren't I? <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, it's, I mean, what, what's also interesting here is you've got the river, which is just in the woodland bank next to us. Yeah. And then you've got this year, the first year that they hadn't cut this, um, this ride down the side here that we're walking on. Yeah. And what you've seen is a sort of instant growth in willow. Yeah. Um, which has just sort of seeded, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Out from, out from that woodland bank. And you can see it's sort of starting to just a little bit further ahead, starting to push out and, 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 and into the field. Yeah. And this is natural diversity, really. And you can see the difference, actually, because you've got this, the river in the bit of wood over there. You've got these trees here. Do you know what these trees are? Not a fan. I'm not good at doing... <laughs> I can do it by bud, but I can't do it from distance. It's not a test, don't worry. <laughs> these are alder. OK. And these uh, like wet places. River. Yeah. yeah. They like very wet ground, as does the willow. And there's a particular type of wet woodland called car, C-A-R-R. Okay. And I think that's an Anglo-Saxon or Norse name. Um, it's for this type of wet woodland. Um, and you'll only find that where the ground's saturated and really wet, because they can cope with it. And then as you come up, so it's got a bit brambly and the grass starts taking over here. But those willow bushes, there's a few coming up here yeah. where it's a little bit damper. But as you get up the slope towards the top, the willow will disappear. And you can see this hedgerow here. And there's a few willows there, and then you get other trees like birch and oak yeah. further up as it gets drier. They can't co birch and oak can't cope with that really saturated ground. Okay. But alder and willow can. And this is the thing with diversity is, you know, nature knows where it wants to be, basically. Now, we've got it. Let's go and see if we can find it. There's a little plant. Over here, here we go. This low growing thing with purpley blue flowers. Oh yeah. There's a bit there, look. Okay. And if you crush it, and have a sniff. Okay. It's quite pungent, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. So what's that? That's ground ivy. Okay. Um, it doesn't, it creeps along like ivy does on a wall. It's not really related to the ivies. Mm. It creeps along the ground. But an old name for it is ale hoof, which okay. I think is old English. Because it used to be used to flavour ale. Oh, okay. I've never tried I've never found any flavour with it. You know, it's quite a pungent smell. You do wonder what it'll taste like, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I'd like it. It's interesting with spring coming on, because you know, it's hearing the different birds starting to turn up. Mm. I mean I can definitely hear chiff chaff. Chiff, chaff, chiff, chaff, yeah, chiff, chaff, chiff, chaff. But there was just then, it's flown off now, I think, of course, uh, <laughs> is a black cap. Okay. Now they've got a more, they are a type of warbler. The males have got, a, they're grey with a black cap. The females and juveniles have got a rusty cap instead. And they've come in, there'll be a few overwinter, strangely, the, the overwintering ones aren't, let's call them our birds. They'll disappear off to Germany to breed. Okay. And our birds, being very parochial here. Our birds have been down to Europe and Africa. Okay. 
and they're all starting to come back in just in these last couple of weeks i've heard them singing and it's a very far it's a bit it's got quite a fruity tone like a blackbird you know that beautiful tone they have but a lot faster mm. so andy we're just coming to a more arable field here yeah um we've got a couple of paths down either side of the field um and it's it's coming into crop now just starting it's only about an inch high the last crop they had in here was a sort of um i think like a fodder crop yeah um which you know we we're all sort of wondering what it was yeah um i think and then what happened was the local farmer put an electric fence around the edge of the field yeah. and brought their sheep in yeah um they turned them out so they, they were sort of exposed on the surface and then brought the sheep in and one of the interesting things we had here and it's the same landowner who has the belt of galloways and does all the con all the conservation work yeah. around here they also run welsh blacks yeah sheep um so you know they're always trying to keep them in good condition and things like mm. that but you've got that interface between walkers and dogs and countryside and stock yeah um and although um they the the farmer sort of let everyone know that they'd be on here for hmm. a couple of months um, and asked people to make sure the dogs didn't um, go into the field and didn't pass through the electric fence. They, I think they lost two or three from, from being killed by dogs. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's that time of year when quite often they're pregnant too. The yeah, sheep. I've seen lambs out already yeah. this year. So, um, you know, the, it was a real concern that people weren't managing their dogs properly. Yeah. Um, so we talk about effective control, yeah. um, which is around being able to recall your dog on command and or having your dog on lead if you're not confident with, mm. with that recall. Um, and you know, it's, it's different, it's difficult because this field changes each season. Sometimes it's got stock in it, sometimes it's, it's just crop, but it's really important to read the landscape you're going into and manage your dog appropriately. Yeah. It's something we've seen a lot of over the last year. And, you know, to be honest, rights of way are an interesting beast in the sense that they are the right to walk across private land. These aren't, this isn't public land, mm. it's private land. So, you know, it's, it's, that, it's, it's understanding that there needs to be a level of respect for the person who's managing their land whilst you're walking across it absolutely you know yeah. and it's you know is that you know we talk about balance a lot but it's understanding and uh, so the sort of balance that you want to enjoy yourself but actually someone's taking a living off this land as well well absolutely so, yes you yeah know. so i was just distracted slightly there was a hair at the top of the field up there right at the top mm. up there you probably, i've got binoculars yeah, I've got so it's a bit I of an advantage um but that's the other thing as well, because there are wildlife around here, is wildlife around here as well. You know, the hares, um, they'll be breeding soon. Mm. And they're not like rabbits, they don't make burrows. Basically, when this has grown up a bit, they'll give birth and the leverets, the young hares, are just left in the field, just crouching down. Mm. So they're very exposed to predators um, and disturbance. And actually, some of these birds we're talking about could be nesting in this short grass and these bushes just at the sides here. Okay. There's quite a lot of birds that nest on the ground. So it's partly knowing that sort of thing. I've had people argue with me, birds don't nest on the ground. Well, they do quite a lot mm. do. Um, and having a dog running through all these bits um, can disturb the wildlife as well. Mm. Um, but it's that balance, isn't it? You know, because we, we're definitely not... I mean, I, I, I'm very good friends with some dogs. You've got a dog yourself, I haven't have, you? I have. <laughs> um, and it's getting that balance right and understanding what's going on. Because this is, you know, this field here, um, it looks like it's down to a spring barley or something like that. Um, it's certainly one of the, like a wheat crop or something. Yeah. I wouldn't know at this height. Yeah. yeah. It needs it to be a bit higher. There's a, Debbie, who I work for, who's a farmer, she once did tell me how to tell barley from wheat, but it's quite complicated <laughs> when it's this tall. Um, but this is a crop here. So... Mm. It's a living landscape that he's trying to manage to produce food that goes eventually on our plate. Um, and doing things like, you know, because we were talking about the meadows. Mm. Um, now, some of these would traditionally be used as grazing areas for animals or as a hay cut. Yeah. Uh, but there's a bit of an feed. issue. Yeah. As feed for animals in the winter. 
And actually when we talked about pasture, that's the grassland areas and that's where it's grazing happens. That's the definition of pasture. Mm -hmm. um, arable is where it's ploughed and turned over and seeds put into the ground. I think we have to be careful even with some, <laughs> maybe not that technical, but you know, making sure people understand it. It's all to do with fruit production, which, you know, I certainly like to eat. <laughs> mm. um, and running through this, it's trampling crops, yeah. you know, and it stops, you know, it can reduce, if you have too many people doing that, it clearly reduce the crop they can get. Yeah. And um, I think there is an issue with dog fouling as well. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that we need to make sure that when we're out, um, you're picking up after, um, after, after, after your pets. Yeah. Um, I, you know, as I say, I walk around here on a regular basis with a dog, but one of the things um, I do, mm. um, I mean, we, we won't see a, we won't see a dog bin here until no. you're back into the town again. No, absolutely. So I have a Ziploc bag. Yeah. So I pick up and I put it in the Ziploc bag. You know, I, put, I, I, I pick up with the, with the black bag. Yeah. bag and I put it in the Ziploc bag, zip it up, put it in my pocket, put it in my rucksack and it's fine, it doesn't smell at yeah. all. But it, what it does mean is that the field and the crop isn't getting um, dog poo through it, Yeah. you know, and it also means that, um, you know, people who are using the path have an enjoyable experience. Yeah. And we're just looking at these, at the edge of the field here actually, there's this little edge of the ploughed area. You see these little volcanoes all over the place? Okay, yeah. That's Very the small, on like yeah. an inch, inch around? Yeah, and you can see some, there's a tiny little hole yeah. of about three or four millimetres across. These are solitary bee nests. Okay. And they like bare ground. Um, some go in the grass a bit more, but they like bare ground. So the, the, heat? the heat gets to the ground and warms it up. So okay. when they make their nests in there, and I say solitary, they're not like honeybees or bumblebees. They don't have workers. Um, it's just the female um, who does all the work there. The males, for most bees and wasps, are utterly useless. They don't do anything to help with it. Apart from mate with a female, that's their only job. She'll come in, she'll make this burrow, and there'll be little individual cells off it where they put pollen in there. Um, they make what they call pollen bread. It's like a mix of nectar and pollen, okay. like a little ball. Lay the egg on it and seal it up, and then make another cell. And that's what these are doing. And there's some, actually, you can see some darker bits around. The soil around that is slightly darker, isn't it? Yeah. It's, there's not many bees I can see here because that's a little bit cool for them yet. Okay. So they can't fly yet. But even in this meter section here, there's maybe a dozen, yeah. maybe two dozen yeah. holes. Um, and, um, but one thing they can do, they can't fly yet because they're not warm enough, but they can dig. Mm -hmm. So until it warms up, they'll dig away. And the moment it warms up, they'll be out flying around all these flowers here. Okay. Um, and pollinators is one thing that's very important that nature gives to the farming community. Um, because there's quite a significant proportion of plants which rely on being pollinated. Mm. Um, wheat and things like that, they're, they're grasses generally. Um, they're, they're wind pollinated, so it blows across and spreads the pollen across the crop. But like oilseed rape needs pollinators to something to fly in and pollinate individual flowers, transfer the pollen around. Okay, uh, quite often I'm seeing um, hives being put out by farmers in some areas. Now why would that happen? Well partly because you know somebody wants to have a hive out and okay. get some honey. But you do find in some places there's so few wild pollinators. Okay that they um, have to bring them in. I mean, it's not as bad as some, the central bits of America, some places, some of the Great Plains, where there's virtually no pollinators. And they ship them in by the lorry load. Okay. Whether it's hives or there's, a, there's a, one of the solitary bees that's one of the leaf cutter bees, and they nest in tubes. And they have, you know, the, the cloth sides on the lorries. Okay, yeah. They put it in the middle of the field, open up the cloth sides, and all these bees come out because there's no native pollinators. Um, one statistic, because I've been working on pollinators with parishes okay. to try and improve them on verges and in their grasslands. Native wildflower meadows have lost 97% of them since the 1940s. Gosh. And that is, you know, and a lot of the places they're squeezed to, so you might have a field there which is what might be termed improved, but that means improved for producing silage 
Okay. It doesn't mean improved in terms of wild species diversity. So that means it's got, it's, it's quite a uh, fertile ground. Yeah, artificial, a lot of artificial fertiliser on it because you're cutting silage now, you want to get several silage cuts off a year, so you enrich it, which makes it very poor for plants, you know, other wild plants. And the, quite often, the little verge at the side of the road, or the side of your right away, has got all the things like scabious and knapweeds and all the plants that used to be in that field there. Okay. Um, so it's a huge loss in pollinators. Um, and there's some things like tomatoes, well, Honeybees won't pollinate tomatoes because okay. it uses something called buzz pollination. Uh, so the insect, and mostly it's bumblebees, mm -hmm. they sit on the flower and buzz their wing muscles and it releases the pollen and the tomato plant won't release the pollen unless it's buzzed. Okay. So if you've got tomato plants, you need bumblebees, not honeybees. So this, this area is quite nice because you've sort of got this sort of steep bank yeah. that we're walking along the side of now. Yeah. Um, but then the, le the ground level changes and it essentially becomes very low. Um, uh, we've got a field between us and the river now. Yeah. But you can see the, the, the landscape is very different and the plants are very different in that field. Um, quite tussocky. Yeah. Um, with quite a lot of reeds growing through it as well. So that's one of the fields that they run the cattle on. See that itself, you can see, as you say, you've got the bank running down, so the field's on the top up there, the crop, mm. and you've got this steeper bank, and then it suddenly goes to this very flat area, doesn't it? Yeah. Over there, which is the meadow you're talking about, and that's a floodplain. Okay. So normally, in a natural process, what would happen is, when the waters get really high, it floods out of the river channel into the surrounding fields. Um, and it probably would have been a water meadow, a managed yeah. water meadow at some point. It can be very good grassland in there, very rich. When I say rich, rich in a good way, yeah. naturally okay. rich. Because the river will flood out, probably not so much with a chalk stream, but they, it deposits a fine layer of silt, which is just enough nutrients to get the grass growing. And actually with the water standing across it in a thin skin, it keeps the frost off. So even in the winter the grass can grow okay so it's fantastic grazing area i mean you can see just around the edge here where the cattle have been in and poached it yeah it's actually you've got almost that standing water so yeah. it does hold a lot of water the water soap must be really high and for my practice style i can see it's not all grass you can see sedges and rushes out there yeah which is a different type of plants of course and it's a bit more diverse out there than just grassland but the other good thing that floodplains are for is natural flood management Okay. So it's a bit different because it's a chalk stream. But you can yeah. imagine, so you've got this big river running down to your village down here. Oh, it's town, isn't it? I yes, yeah, so it is a town. It's a I, town, get, I yes. constantly get corrected on that. <laughs> um, if all that is channeled straight down the river, the chance site will flood the town. Mm. Now, we've got this at Winchester, I know. Um, so what you can do, if you can make the river above the town more natural, so it disperses, it it sort of spreads out into the floodplain mm. and then it takes more time to get down through the channels and it stops the peak flow. Um, in, back in 2013, we had all those big floods. Were you around at that point? No, I didn't come down here to 2016. Yeah, 2013, we had that terrible flooding year. Massive amount of rain. Mm. And it was flood defences all through Winchester. And what they've done is, and what they did then, but they've improved them now, is at Winnelmore, north of the town, they've put, allowed the water to get back into the floodplain, to spread back out and um, be held in those meadows just a bit longer, so it stops the peak, it's lower, so they need less flood defences, and Winchester hasn't flooded since that point. Okay, and so... That's, and that's part of natural flood management. So that's the area just north of... Winchester, yeah, um, going up to where the Worthies are and Martin Worthy. That's so it, yeah. you've got sort of again multiple channels, yeah, um, and and through that area, quite um, quite a wet landscape. Yeah, that's the itching that runs through Winchester, and it turns round up towards Allsford. Yeah, uh, so you've got a very wet landscape similar to this. Yes, but it's very, but the channel as it goes through Winchester. It's quite tight. Yeah, narrows quite a Narrows, bit. and they yeah. built this city in the wrong place. 
Alfred's got, and the Romans have got a lot to answer for there. But what you can do is you can employ the natural systems above to hold back the water that bit longer. Hmm. This is probably my favourite view, I think. Yeah. If you just up, up on the top of the bank there, looking down this field, you've got, you know, a very green, nutrient-rich field, which they run their grazing in. Yeah. Um, you've got a hanging woodland um, on the side of the hillside coming down and joining it. Yeah. And you've got a sort of flat field, and then you've got an even flatter bit as you move into the floodplain. Um, I saw, but it's that, it's that wondrous field. This field curves away. Yeah. And one of the things I find really useful when I'm walking my dog here is that I'll put him on a lead for the first 100 metres of this field. Yeah. Because just round the corner, yeah. we could have the stock. Mm. Yeah? That's and it. And as soon as I get round the corner, I can, put him, I can take him off the lead um, when I'm confident there's no stock in the field. But at this time of year when they're lambing, yeah. I think it's extra important to make sure that you're being respectful. Yeah, because um, th that's the thing. It's sort of, well, right where, we're just about to go through a gate here, but right where we are now, there's actually stock netting between us and that field, yeah. which would normally stop your dog going through. But actually, I can see, as we come into the field, this, there's nothing between us and the open field. And there is actually a sheep over there. Ah. <laughs> so as I said, you yeah. know, you, could, you couldn't see that sheep 10 metres ago. And unless you've been really observant, yeah. you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't see it. And your dog might be off. And if your dog is one of those dogs which, you know, isn't, doesn't, you don't have close control with, mm. um, you know, they may, they may well chase the sheep or disturb the sheep. And they might not even get in contact with the sheep. No. You know, I'm not talking about, clearly there are cases where dogs bite sheep. Mm. Um, but, um, and attack them in that way, but just making it run. When you're a quite a corpulent old you with um, two, two lambs inside you, when they're just about to give birth, running isn't good for you. I don't think, <laughs> I don't think it's good for any pregnant person when at that, it's at that stage in their pregnancy. Yeah, so. But, um, it's, yeah, it's certainly, you know, there is quite a few, I don't know the numbers, but miscarriages which occur mm. with, if, if sheep have been disturbed by us as we're out and about enjoying our countryside. But I mean, even though you might not see the sheep, it's quite, I mean, clearly there were signs up there saying there were livestock in here. Um, and actually, with grass that short, clearly something's doing that. <laughs> so as you say, reading the landscape. Yeah. I mean, you can go for months without the sheep being in this field. Oh, yeah. Um, and then the sheep will be back in here for a number of months again. Yeah. So you say hanger woodland here. Yeah. I mean, we're not normally talking about up on the downs with hangers, but it's just this slight slope up here with trees on it. Yeah. I mean, it's probably allowed to grow like that because it's just too much faff yeah, to manage it. Yeah, it, so they let the trees grow. It can't be grow. cultivated, um, you know, so they let the trees grow. But actually what it does is creates a really interesting habitat. Again, multiple, you know, we've got within sight line, multi <coughs> multiple types of habitat. Yeah. Um, what I like about this woodland um, throughout the year, actually, because we're on the north side here, you move into shadow. Yeah. And actually the temperature difference between, you know, 100 yards ago yeah. and here is really... Even really, today, yeah. when it's not that much sun, you can feel the warmth starting yeah. to come through back there. Um, you know, so that, you know, I was talking a little bit about mindfulness when you're walking. I think recognising the, that difference and go, ah, oh, that's interesting. And just sort of feeling that difference and then seeing whether, whether or not actually this sort of dark side of the moon type hillside here <laughs> is it's not quite um, that bad <laughs> is um you know is different yeah yeah absolutely and you can see it's a different range of plants in there you know there's lots of um what do we can we see here oh there's some actual little violets there it's okay. not a violet color this one it's a white one but <laughs> telling violets apart is quite a fine art and i'm not going to try and claim i know which violet that is <laughs> But there's loads of people call them arum lily here. Okay. So the broad arrow shaped things with the spots on the leaves. Uh, cuckoo flower, cuckoo pint rather. Lords and ladies, yes. Um, 
So many different country names for these things. So it's amazing, it's just not just wildlife, it's the history of things you see around here as well, isn't it? It's that fantastic cultural history, is, which is ingrained into the landscape, isn't it? Oh, very much, very much. But I think, it's, I think you've got that wish from people to try and keep that, cult that culture strong and maintained. And, yeah. and so we're approaching Beer Mill here. Um, rather unfortunately, three, or three, maybe four years ago, we had a very large fire here and um, very nearly destroyed the whole building. We lost maybe two thirds of it. And then I've spent the last sort of three years rebuilding it and restoring yeah. it. Um, it's, um, you know, which, but it's a stunning building. It was before, but I'm, I'm really, it's really special that they've restored it back to the condition it was. Yeah. Um, so Beer Mill has, Beer Mill was the mill I was um, talking to you about, or you were mentioning a little bit earlier, um, that was involved in the very first printed paper yeah. used by the Bank of England. Yeah. Um, so in the 1700s. So, um, and, you know, paper is still made in this area now. Yeah. Um, up in Overton. Um, so they still make paper notes yeah um obviously we're moving to plastic yeah so there is a, a shift at the moment but our paper notes are still made in overton it's the first style we've seen is on this route isn't it yeah because there's a bit of a move away from well it has been for some time i think with access with going away from styles to little gates yeah well the principle is that a style is there to prevent what they call ingress egress of livestock that's its only reason it's there yeah let them um, get them in Stop so, them getting in and out. Stop them getting in, 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 in and out. So where there is livestock, a farmer can install a structure. Yeah. Which it can be a gate, can be a, um, a style, yeah. which is what's traditional. But the idea is that those people who are perhaps less mobile, perhaps pushing a push chair, perhaps um, just as they're getting older, they, you can't lift your legs across these styles and things yeah, like that. I can't that. get my leg over these days. <laughs> But, you know, so the idea is to take out the styles and replace them with a gate yeah. um, or, or a kissing gate. Yeah. Um, but the, um, I think one of the things which is quite often misunderstood is that the, it's not my responsibility to manage the gates and styles. Mm. Those are there for the landowner. They're the landowner's responsibility to, to manage. Um, we, we help out, we give grants and we pr provide structures if we, want a, if we want a quality of product in, yeah. in, in, in there. But they're actually there purely for, um, for livestock. And if the livestock isn't present, we're actually proactively asking people to take them out yeah. as, as landscapes change. Yeah. Because I mean, they can be, as you say, as you get older, a bit more and more difficult to go over. They rock about a bit, they get a bit rotten. You know, you turn a heel on it and all that sort of thing. So a kissing gate where you've got an open st structure that opens and shuts itself, or it's in a little box, isn't it? Mm. So that animals can't work their way through there. Yeah. Now, yeah. technically, we get into all sorts of discussions then, because every area has traditionally had its own gates and things like that. Yes. But in time, we've moved to using metal gates quite often. Yeah. Um, now, the main reason for that isn't their intrinsic appeal it's to do with maintenance yes because you've just mentioned with the style they get a bit wobbly um what happens is that the um is that the ground shrinkage yeah. occurs different times of the year and then it, or the um or the wood starts to rot yeah whereas if you can put in a structure which is metal and connected its lifespan and level of maintenance it, you know, it, they, they'll be there for a very long period of time yes. and they need almost no maintenance. Yeah. So therefore you can ensure that the farmer doesn't have to keep on going back there and fixing it. We don't have to continue going back to the farmer and asking them to fix it. Yeah. Um, and you end up with a really good structure, almost in perpetuity. Yeah. And we're coming back to join the river here, so um, a beer mill. Um, which is a very, it's a very lovely place. It really is. Um, the landowner quite, quite regularly opens the gardens at the mill to the public yeah. as part of the National Garden Scheme. 
um, and um, we've got um, a beautiful bridge in front of us, three arch bridge across the river, um, and we've also got um, the enterprise which they've been running here, which is the butchery, does a bit of ice cream, does um, the meat, but it's, a, it's just a cracking location. Just noticing we've got a little tiny, before the bridge, a little tiny bit of clearly wettish grass they've clearly planted wildflowers on. There's some which aren't native wildflowers, I have to say. A few of the tulips, you know, things like the, these, these look like cultivated varieties of anemones. But you see these purple dangly sort of, bell things? Yes. That's snake's head fritillary. Ah, now I thought it was a fritillary. I didn't know what type it was. Which is a very rare plant in this county now. Okay. And it's reduced it. Because it relies on these old water meadows being managed properly. Now I'm suggesting that they're not native. They are a native species, but they've been planted here. Yeah. But they're beautiful things. They're called snake's head because um, they've got, they're normally this purple. You do get a few white ones, but they've got this sort of snake skin checkered pattern yes. on them. But they're a native and it's good they're here. But I think they've been planted amongst the mix of other, but it's nice to see them. But they look stunning. They do actually, yeah. They really do. So we're walking across a, a grassland, I'll call it, rather than a meadow. Yes. Say. This is quite clearly improved. You can see that a lot of the grasses are much thicker across the blade. They're not very fine grasses. And you, I think you know these yellow flowers, don't you? Oh yeah. Dandelions? Dandelion, yes. They can be a bit of a sign of improvement. You know, they do look quite like rich stuff. They're nice plants, but um, sometimes when people look across a oh, they think, oh, flower-rich meadow, it's, it tends to be oxide daisy. Yeah. And a few buttercups and a dandelion or two, which doesn't really give you the witchness of yeah. one, you know, where you could, could on a flower-rich meadow, you could have a dozen different plant species in one meter. Okay. So. Well, as I was saying, this field and the field we were walking on a bit earlier very much has stock in it most of the yeah, time, yeah. but it's on rotation. Yeah. So at the moment, it's entirely clear. I'll tell you what, walking with you t today, I don't think I've noticed the bird song as much, but I have, <laughs> I have, we, I have while walking with you heard the bird song. Yeah. Which I do hear, but I, I don't think I've heard it as much as when I've been walking with you and you've been pointing things well, out. Well, it's been really good to meet you out here today, Jonathan. It's, I've, it's been a lovely day, has to be said. You know, lovely, mild, no rain, yeah. but it can be beautiful any time of year. But it's been a really nice route and it's been enjoyable getting back to meet you again. Yeah, well, thanks, Andy. I think it's just been, I found it really educational and I found it really enjoyable because I've learned so much while mm. I've been coming around the route here. But I think it's, uh, it's just always nice to share some, an area that I enjoy mm. with other people. And, you know, thanks for coming. It's my pleasure. I hope to see you again soon. Yeah, definitely. <laughs>
Oh, you can even make your own dandelion wine. Yeah, I've, heard, I've never had dandelion wine. I've had a few, I've had Bert Sap wine, but not dandelion. No, I've had dandelion coffee. Yeah, that, I mean, that was certainly something they used in the war when you couldn't get hold of things like real coffee. I mean, was it any good? No, it doesn't taste like coffee. <laughs> I suppose if you're in dire straits, you know, halfway through a war where you've got no coffee, anything will do. <laughs> I think anything, yeah. In that case, anything will do. Because they used to use acorns as well, didn't they? They did. That's a very long process for acorns, though. So do you know where the name dandelion comes from? I think it's Don de Lyon. Don de Lyon, which is French. For? Teeth of, li- teeth of the lion. Because they do look like they've got, they've got a toothed edge to the leaf, haven't they? Yes. Which does look like teeth. Whether well, they're big enough for a lion, I'm not sure. Uh, be a small lion, I think. And another name for them is um, pissabed. That's because it's a diuretic and it makes you wet yourself. Yeah, so it's one of the medicinal uses. I mean, yeah. I, you, you do wonder sometimes... You know, I suppose for some of the old traditions of purging, mm-hmm. you've got, you know, you need to balance your humours, so yeah. you need to purge, so let's stick something in you which flush you out. So <laughs> Wouldn't necessarily suggest that now. No, I wouldn't, no. There are a lot of medicinal uses, a lot of plants that we've talked about, but they need to be treated very carefully. They do. So I hope you have all enjoyed this episode of Looking After Nature. We'd love to hear from you with any comments or thoughts, or if there's anything you'd like us to discuss in a future episode, you can let us know by checking out our social media pages. And we'd really appreciate it if you rate and review our podcast on iTunes, as this helps other people find us. For now, thanks again for listening. I'm Andy Davidson. And I'm Carly Harrod. See you next time.